when they say you have no right, you prove that you do by going back to the river. All the European nations uh, that came to these shores and then the United States later uh, signed treaties with Indian tribes. And there's a basic reason for that. Governments don't do business through memoranda of understanding or contracts. They do treaties. It's a high and a distinguished form of law and the European nations and the United States knew that Indian tribes were nations and that the proper method of dealing with them uh, was through the treaties. And the treaties went back to the United States Senate for confirmation, just like international treaties. In fact, in the early days, up through the 1850s, there were more Indian treaties than there were treaties with foreign nations. And so the same process, same level of dignity was used. In the beginning, after the treaties, the racism, of course, was great. But the tribes were mostly on their reservations. And there wasn't that much conflict over the fishing because of uh, uh, the fact that there weren't that many non-Indian fishers starting, let's say, in the 1870s, by which time you had canning operations where you could send these magnificent fish um, worldwide. And so now uh, you, you had real competitors with the, 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 the tribal fishers. And people started to crack down on the tribes and started to blame shortages on the tribes. And so through the 1890s, the early 1900s, 20s, 30s, 40s, increasing crackdown on Indian fishers, calling them renegades. Who the hell are they to be fishing outside of state law? And we went into this period um, that, uh, of the Indian fish wars that is essentially unlike any series of events in American history in terms of the violence and the wide spread of it throughout a particular region. The only real comparator that you can have, I think, is a series of events happening at about the same time over segregation in the South. Finally, when the Bolt decision was affirmed by the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court, in a footnote, said that other than some desegregation cases in the South, the civil disobedience by Washington state officials is the single greatest act of defiance of federal law witnessed in this century. And it was that, and the tribes had Supreme Court opinions um, in, in 1905, in 1942, acknowledging the treaties, acknowledging broad tribal rights, but the states kept enforcing in spite of those federal laws. Yeah, the state fishery, you know, they were always really against us, you know, they were totally against us, you know, and that's, that's where they, even up here, they, you know, on the shallow, they'd always give us a bad time, you know, come on, you get back up there on the res, you know, and, uh, but then uh, when our beat saints were out there legal on the res, you know, fishing on the res, then you'd have about three, four state patrol, really fast, heavy boats, you know, just come and they'd run them as tight as they can to the, uh, to the net, running to kind of scare the fish out. So we used to fish right out here in uh, Bellingham Bay. Mm -hmm. A lot of the guys had little sand boats at that time, you know, like 32 footers, 40 footers. And they had a boundary line, I think it ran from Point Francis to the off road, or they called Treaty Rock. 
and they used to have a boat called the Governor John R. Rogers, and they'd be patrolling there all the time, watching the boats, make sure they didn't drift over. And we, you know, for years and years, they'd done that to us. And even when Jim, my brother Junior, was running a boat out there, we our fished with him. And I can remember us just picking it up so fast, you know, so it wouldn't drift and everything was done by hand. And we'd pick up real fast and ebb tide, make sure we didn't drift over that line because that boat would be standing there watching us. They used to give us a hard time, the governor, governor John R. Rogers, run that line all day long, running the, they were that strict to us that they, that they made that uh, game warden run the line all day long. Look at all the gas and everything and time we put out there just to keep us on inside the bay here. That was what it was all about, is the government wanted us to stay on reservation. We weren't supposed to have anything to do with the fish when they came off reservation, which was a bunch of crap. The fish were the fish that was promised to us, to us in the treaty, you know. Billy would come by, he'd go down the river, you know, he'd fish at night and come back up the river in his canoe. And uh, I fished up around the corner there, then person that gave one come down and he said, you know, you can't fish down there. I said, oh, Erickson was his name, and he kept telling me, you got to pull your net, you got to get up. I said, okay, yeah, that's all I'd say, and I'd go back fish, you know. Then, then at 50, what was it, 58, 59? I started fishing at the trestle, and that's when they first picked me up. And that's when, that's when they first picked me up, and then, uh, then, then on, it was, it was about every other day they was picking me up. <laughs> You know, Nuji, I was telling Nuji, I said, they can't do this, Nuji. We'd hear the, the, the doors slam behind us, we were going in jail. We always laugh about that. Billy, he's always saying, you, we can't, they can't do this to us, but they lock us up. The movement was, uh, uh, us going to jail, you know, right here at the landing here. Fort Lewis is over there. The state game department was watching us 24 hours a day here. And uh, we continued to fish. We fished every day. We continued to fish. We'd fought him every day. We'd fight him. We'd go to jail, get out of jail, come back, go to jail again, get out of jail, come back, fishing. We never gave up, you know, we just continued the struggle going on and on. They started uh, going to jail. There were fights along the river. I mean, these guys were out to hurt you. They weren't just doing simple things. They wanted to hurt you and they wanted to hurt you bad. They'd carry these long flashlights and it was like they were terrorizing the Indians. It was really a hard time and a real struggle, you know, and that's what's so angry is when these guys went to jail, we sat home and we starved as families, but you know, it didn't matter to them. And But I think the battles were hard. It was hard on families. And it wasn't, you know, just Nuji. It was Nuji's kids, Nuji's wife, Babe's family, you know, and Billy's family and Don McLeod's family, you know, the kids are crying because their dads are being hit over the head. They're being put in jail, you know, because the state thinks they have the right to tell Indian people what to do. And, and grandparents were having to watch kids, you know, because when they could no longer fight, then the women had to go out and fight like Jeanette, you know, Suzanne Sataika, Maisel Bridges, Allison, Suzette, you know, Billy Louise and us, we would all go out there and we would try to do the fight, you know, with the state of Washington. And when we got done, we didn't have anything. They took our boats, they took our nets. Did they take the fish too? Yeah. They just took everything from you. My dad was in jail. I think I was in the first grade, first or second grade. We lived in McKenna. Well, my mom said, well, the kids are going to stay at the landing with their grandma, and I'll take you in to get shoes. And I'll stop in and see your dad. 
And I said, oh boy, I get to go see my dad, you know, in jail. And so I went up there and um, the jails were, uh, had metal doors and they had little slants like that. They could just look out with your eyes. And they had little things there. And so I was all excited until my mother lifted me up and um, I could only see his eyes. And I started crying. And I tried to um, not cry and because uh, he started um, crying. And, and um, I was the only child there. I mean, all the other, like, Porgy was there and Marilyn and Josie, and, you know, they were all there to see their husbands. But I was the only child that was brought there and because um, they had to get shoes. So after I see my dad, I went down the line and, and seen the rest of the guys in jail. And they tried to cheer me up. And um, my uh, dad told my mom, don't bring the kids here. Because they were having a hard time because they were eating three meals a day. And they knew that their children weren't eating like they were. They knew that the wives were struggling to put food on the table. And, and that was really an um, a, a, a emotional uh, breaking point in my life where, where I knew that, you know, something was wrong here. And so um, at a time in history, the 1960s, when the tribes were at their all-time low point, when Vine Deloria Jr. said, we better win this one because if we don't, there won't be another one. Indian people in the Northwest somehow found the resourcefulness to say no and take it to the limit. You know, when they say you have no right, you prove that you do by going back to the river. And so there is, uh, <clears throat> in October, of 1965. It is a key turning point uh, in what would, would, would happen in, in future actions. They'd just come down on us, you know, the, the Washington, the whole state of Washington. I mean, people from the other side of the mountain were called in, as Hank was talking about, and uh, but 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 it it was pre announced and there yeah. were you know the Indians were together in support so there was and unfortunately there was primarily Indian women and Indian yeah. children right. and then the renegade fishermen um, and they, I mean we had a battle I mean it was clubbing and everything uh, I mean, it was just a knock-down, drag-out fight, and a lot of our kids and women were there, and uh, oars, swinging oars, and battling, you know. And, uh, you know, it just was a, a day to remember, you know. On October 13th, 1965, I was 12. And, and um, this was, uh, uh, we all went to school, and and our dad really didn't want us to go down there for this fishing. And what it was, it was an old ratted old fish, or yeah, rotten fish, put in this net. And, and so it was, it, it was just the fishing. And they did that all the time. And um, anyway, uh, so our dad said, no, they should just go home. And mom said, oh, they can come down and get some ex experience. experience. And so we um, got off the bus, and Dad picked us up and went down to the landing. There was, um, there was a lot of women and children there. And um, so we're all just goofing around. And Mom says, uh, all of a sudden, she said, look. And we turned around, and, and these game agents are coming out of the bushes behind. And these guys are big guys. 
And we see them in their jet boats, put them in the water, and they're running, running with these jet boats and, and putting them in the water. And they ran that canoe. Now, my little brother can't swim. And, um, but luckily, where they were at when they ran that canoe, he could walk, you know, back. To, and then the attack was just on. They, um, they grabbed my uh, cousin and, and was pounding her head into the... And, and, and we're young. She must have been about 14. And uh, they're just slamming people around. They have Dorian in, in the bushes and Don George. And, and they got their shirts off and they're hitting them with these um, blackjacks, I think they call them. And uh, they're grabbing my dad and, and my mom and my, I mean, just, it just went chaos. And, and my grandmother was just, uh, just fear was in her face. We were trying to figure out how, what the strategy was going to be for all of us, just trying to figure out, uh, you know, we're going to fish, we're going to have fish-ins, we're going to do whatever we have to do to, uh, to get the treaties of the United States up to the level of everybody's thinking and, uh, and uh, make the United States protect us. And so that was part of everything we were doing in U.S. versus Washington when it came about in 1974. But up until that time, we, we, uh, we, uh, we marched with Martin Luther King back in Washington, D.C. All of our people, Nisqually and Puyallup and all of us, Muckleshoot, all of us marched in in Washington, D.C. And uh, with Martin Luther King, we were marching for our treaty rights and for our, uh, our, our right as Indian people and our culture and our way of life. And uh, we were trying to protect that even though the civil rights movement was going full blast and Martin Luther King was bringing it to the front. We, uh, we, uh, marched with him and uh, then after that we took over the BIA building in Washington DC and uh, we negotiated ourselves out of that President Nixon was president at that time you know President Nixon was a good good president as we could see he didn't kill us as in that building he, uh, he we negotiated ourselves out of there and we came to San Francisco and we took over uh, Alcatraz Island. You know, that was one of the movements of all of, all of our Indian people. And uh, we negotiated ourselves out of there. We had an, a fish camp under the I-5 bridge, the only Puyallup River uh, tribal land that was there left. They raided us that morning and threw us all in jail. I was in, went, took my wife to the hospital in Seattle and on the way back home I was listening to the radio and they were saying, well, there's a big war going on in Puyallup. So I pulled off the road there just where the road is, where the railroad bridge, then the old bridge on the other side. I got, I got down there and there was uh, state patrol, SWAT teams from Tacoma, uh, fish, not fish and game, not, not the fisheries, but the, the game department. And I suppose the fisheries was there too. And when I got out of my car, man, that tear gas hit my face. It was already gone, but it was still strong. So I walked over and there was about three or four white people standing there watching too. And, and well, everybody kind of pulled out. I said, don't worry. I gotta go see who's down there, if anybody got hurt or what's going on. So I went down there and the first one I ran into was old Hank Adams. I was only there about 15, 20 minutes. And there was Billy Frank. Hank says, if I were you, I wouldn't stick around too long. 
we're going to burn that bridge. They went over and they had diesel and gas, and they poured it all around the base of that bridge. So I walked around downstream and then back around and got back to the railroad track and then kawoom, man, that gas and that bridge. I thought that bridge was all burned up. It didn't even hurt it. Uh, one of the key elements and most effective, what makes As Long As Rivers Run effective in the end is the footage on the Puyallup encampment bust of 1970. The open aggression of, of the police force, police power of the state of Washington. The, these things moved uh, the world beyond where it was at that point for Indian people, uh, for Nisqually's and Puyallup's, but also other Indian people. And they gassed us that day. They, they gassed all of us that day. And it so happened that that day, the United States Attorney General was watching us that day. And he got gassed too. You know, they all come down to see what was going on. They knew that the, the sheriff and the police and state patrol, all of them were gonna come down on us. And so they, they all come to watch, the federal government come to watch. And, uh, and they watched us, and they also got gassed that day. And that's, that triggered the U.S. versus Washington. That, that the, the United States said we're gonna take, we're gonna take on the United, U.S. versus Washington, and that's what started the Bolt decision. And so uh, the case goes before Judge George Hugo Bolt, a conservative judge appointed by President Eisenhower. The tribal attorneys wondered at the beginning of the case if they shouldn't try to have him removed from the case. But they, they went with him. They, they saw that uh, in some of the early motions he was paying attention that he didn't seem to have a predisposition, a mindset against the idea that the treaties might carry significant rights. <clears throat> the testimony of the elders was very important at trial. And uh, they told stories about treaty time and the state attorneys objected. And Judge Bolt let the testimony in because he understood that the oral tradition can send down very valuable information. And he heard them out. And on February 12th, 1974, Judge Bolt intentionally chose Lincoln's birthday uh, as a, a statement of this opinion, which by any reasonable standard is one of the great moments in American law. Judge Bolt handed down a decision that the tribes can be proud of, but every American should be proud of because it honored a sacred promise and it allowed dispossessed peoples, the least among us at that time, to have their most sacred rights protected. I have so much respect for Judge Bolt that he was threatened, death threats, but he never took a step backwards. He made one of the greatest decisions that was ever made that set a precedent clear across the United States that tribes do exist, treaties do exist, tribes are sovereign, and now tribes are co-managers. But it was a great day for Indian people, you know, to not, it didn't stop what was happening, you know, it just, aggravated it made it worse to a way but we had fought up to then and we sure as hell wasn't going to quit fighting after that we started to expand out to reclaim what we thought was rightfully our treaty areas and each time we we expanded out to our various areas we were then experiencing all of these emotions where there were a lot of upset people just didn't think it was right for Indian people to practice their treaty rights. 
it just ain't right. We started getting these threats, and then we started experiencing actual assaults. We were willing to face the enemy. You can't stop me. This is my right. The threat was that they're going to come down and raid our camp and, and teach us some manners. The hour came. They actually gave us the hour when they're coming, so be ready. Well, so, well okay, so what? Just let them come. American Indian Movement is here. <laughs> Us combined with the with AIM, commonly called AIM. Go, oh, what's the word? Let them come. We dare them to come. And so at the appointed hour, AIM pulls out their big war drum. Started preparing, singing the war song. You could hear this echoing all over the community. <coughs> State fisheries did come. They said we never saw them, but we had. People were stay, stay outpost, watch. You tell us what you see. Boy came. They're here, but they heard your drum and they left. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> retreat. <laughs> and the tribal leadership in, in those days, you know, uh, led by that Nisqually and Pialup and Squaxin and, and Muckleshoot and those guys. Um, when they led that effort and they fought for their rights, um, it changed reluctantly the, the recognition of our status as, as governmental entities. The 50% rule that we preserved up to 50% of the resource, that, that we did not relinquish it, we reserved it. It was politically and legally, it was, it was a change of the guard, of, of the attitude towards Indian people. And I always get surprised because who was it? Was it Joseph? Yeah. Said, I'll fight no more. That isn't true. We've had to fight continually. You know, even if it's a different time and things have changed, they still haven't changed much. We just do it in a different way place, not on the banks of the river, but the courthouse. We're willing to sit down, we're willing to listen, we're willing to negotiate, but we're not willing to not be a sovereign tribe. We're not willing for you to give us trinkets and buy, you know, beads anymore. We have access to some of the best attorneys around and we do know where the steps of the courthouse is. And we will go there, you know, those days are gone. We're now seen as leaders. They're now saying, if you want this done, get the tribe involved. If you want to make this thing happen, the tribe is, is how it's going to happen. And so they look to us as leaders now. They respect that, that we care. But I think the Bolt decision really opened the door for the tribes, you know. And so, and I hope for, and I, I believe in some of that is uh, Bolt had, uh, you know, everyone has to enhance the, the salmon runs, you know. So. I think that's probably one of the greatest aspects of the Bolt decision, you know, restore the salmon for everyone, you know. And uh, I got to get this message down to our younger people that are here now. These things just didn't grow out of the water. They were, they came out of blood from the tribes. Our guys got shot at and they, were, they got beat up. They got equipment stolen, tore up. Just so much happened on there but we're, we're, still, we're still in there fighting. When I'm in a meeting and I, I think about my parents, I think about the people, I think about what happened on the river. I mean, because actually they were fighting for the treaty rights, for the freedom for our people to you know, exercise their rights. And so yeah, every, every day, yeah, I mean, we deal with issues like that, uh, and, and I think about that, you know, it's always there. We need to learn to live on this earth and then take care of her because she's dying. And if she dies, then we die. So I think that uh, the future is, is up to the generation.
coming generations can make that determination. Hopefully they're going to find, follow, follow their heart. Be an Indian first. Follow that Indian heart. And it'll take you in the right direction. Take it with confidence. Build your, your mind and your strength. Use what opportunity we have now to, to help to build on those policies. The choice is yours. I'm 78 years old and I'm still out there fishing and crabbing. Every day, you know, when we can get out there with my niece and my nephews. And they all say, is Uncle out? And he said, yeah, Uncle's still out there yet. Gee, we better get out there and keep an eye on You know, anybody that works together always better than fighting. That's what I try to teach everybody. Respect yourself, respect others, and a little love will go a long way. When I was young and raising my family and everything, I hated to miss a day of fishing. I just couldn't think of not being out there with the rest of the boys. You know, it, uh, I noticed it that much. It hurt my feelings if something happened that attic. I couldn't go out fishing one day. Because we're all fishermen, all my relations, all the, my good friends. But I always been on the boat with him. He tells me stories about me being on a boat with him. He says he always used to take diapers and a bottle, so he'd have to take care of me while we were fishing. That's the story he says. I don't know if it's true or not, but I hope so. It's kind of all I've done because it's what he's done. So it's probably the only thing I would do because I love it so much. And now my son's into it. He's fishing off on his own, so. I'm 50-some years old, my dad's 85. You know, and when the wind blows, he calls me, are you all right? You know, and, and that, I think that's pretty neat, but I'm probably gonna do the same thing to my son when he's 50-some years old, and hopefully I'm 80-some, saying, are you all right, and everything fine. You know, the fishing's up. It doesn't seem like work. It's just a way of life. I think, and I expect, and you have to expect this as a fisherman. I, I expect great things down the road is fishing, or I wouldn't be in it. So we have to, you know, to seriously talk about that at some point in time here. Because we're, we're fishery managers, our tribes. And I think the way the tribes are managing the fisheries now is, is, are pretty good. That, that there's always going to be a su sustainable fishery in this area because of the way that I think the tribes manage it. They're a lot more sophisticated than the state is in managing the resource. So I have, I have high hopes for the future. And here we are today. We're, we're managing our, our resource. We, uh, we have the infrastructure, the best infrastructure these 20 tribes have the best infrastructure in the world is right here in our country. We're managing this sound, Puget Sound down here. We're managing all of our watersheds and rivers. <laughs> And that's what we're doing right here, to see all of our fishermen fishing and enjoying life. This is what it's all about. Every, every day I come down here when our, fishing, our fishermen are fishing, it just makes me feel good.
that, that uh, our boys and girls are fishing on the river and nobody is coming down arresting them. They're, they, they regulate themselves and uh, that's why you see us pulling our nets out today. We don't put them back in till next week, let the salmon go up and spawn. And this is a regulation that we do and we're proud of that. Before the decision in 1974, the state of Washington just took as many fish as they could. They never, they never regulated anything. Until 1974, the federal judge come in and said, it's going to be regulated, and it is today. And that, that's who we are. We're Indian people. We've always regulated our natural resource. All of our whole thousands of years, we have regulated this country. We regulated our trees. We, our, our medicines are all over here. You know, and our, <clears throat> our culture is with us today, our language and our dances and our drums. All of these things are, are, are what makes us whole. We want to continue to work with all of our, our people around us, uh, you know, to keep our water, keep our trees, you know, keep our habitat, you know, keep fighting for the salmon, keep fighting for our animals, the food chain of life. You know, we look at this river and it's still flowing, you know. And as long as it's flowing, we're going to be all right. Hey.